When I awoke, the moonlight was shining into the cabin, and I was alone. I still sat on the floor, leaning against the chair, but where her knee had been, she had placed a pillow, and she had wrapped a blanket about me. Rising, I reverently put the pillow and blanket back on the bed. How still, how moonlit that room was. It was so beautiful that it was holy, and it was no place for me, Billy Duncan, soldier of fortune, rolling stone. I was feeling better then. I was used to hard knocks, and that sleep had done me a world of good. Still, I was rather weak as I went on deck, and I had to hold to the rail as I made my way toward my cabin. It was a still night, not a bit of breeze to fill out sails, and the Caliban stood still. I leaned against the mast in the white moonlight, listening to the crew wailing something down in their quarters, and I thought of God's country and her. It was then that I heard two voices, Douglas Steele's and hers, and looking around the mast, I saw them on the other side of the ship, leaning against the rail, talking. She was a beautiful sight to the poor woman-starved man that I was, so I stood and looked at her, watching the moonlight cast shadows about her face. She was dreamily looking at the silver trail the moon made across the water, and scarcely listening to Douglas Steele. But look here, Court. You can't stay out here. You are no missionary, and you know it. I can stay out here. I am a missionary, and I'm going to wash dirty little Japs and teach him not to stick knives in people. He threw up his hands in despair. Court, you must come home. Court, you know I love you for the tenth time. Won't you marry me? He was smiling when he said the last, but he was dead serious. Somehow the pain in my heart then was sharper than the bite had been of Juan Mardo's knife. But not that I would have liked Douglas Steele to have had her, for if ever man loved woman, he did her. But, oh, Charlie boy, I wanted her so. No, Doug, I've work to do here, and I cannot marry you. I felt for Steele when he heard that, but he threw back his shoulder and said just as quietly, then I'll wait till your work is finished, little lady. Little lady. That's what I always thought of her as. She did not speak. Then her eyes sparkled. Wasn't that one glorious scrap this afternoon? I could have laughed. How quickly her moods changed. She could be imperious, tender as a mother, like a giggling schoolgirl, then possessing all the wisdom of centuries of women, and full of enthusiasm and life as a little boy. It sure was. That man is a born fighter. He's a mighty good fellow. She grinned in recollection. He's sure gone on you, little lady, he said, lighting a cigarette. I started angrily at first, but then I forgave him. It was true. His lover's eyes were sharp, and besides, we were almost in the same boat. I waited breathlessly to hear her reply. Don't be an idiot, Doug. But he is. You can tell that by his eyes, for he never uses his mouth. His eyes remind me of that collie you had last year. He's a queer fellow. He's a mighty good fellow. He reminds me of a bulldog with that jaw of his. He's a good fellow, Doug. And it's a pity he's not more than he is. But he never had a chance. Good night, Doug. I'm going to bed and she left him alone in the moonlight. God, how selfish he was. He wanted all of her, and I, I'd have died for a kiss, or lived a life of hell for a lock of her gold-brown hair. We made lace in the next morning, and though we had only an hour's stay there, we took the little lady and Douglas Steele into the town. You see, Charlie, Laysen was a pretty big island, but there was only one town on it, and it was a miserable, fever-struck, swampy place. Japs lived all over the island, so did the natives, but the few white planters lived near the town. The cap and I took the two up to Senora Castro, who took lodgers. The Senora was a great scoundrel, though a good-natured one, and her prices were exorbitant. But Miss Ross and Steele paid without a murmur. Evidently, they were used to more expensive things at home and fancied themselves getting off easily. 
Captain Jim knew most of the white planters at Laysan intimately, and he wrote several letters of introduction for them. I sat out under a bamboo while he wrote, for I was weak from yesterday's fight. Soon she came out. Mr. Duncan, I think you might have given us some letters of introduction, too. Letters from me, I said, trying to laugh. If the letter was from me, I'm afraid they'd have thrown you out, Miss Ra Can't you call me Courtney? She laughed as she flung herself on the grass. Courtney. Call her by her first name? Somehow I could not do it. No, I murmured awkwardly. I can't. To me, you are always the little lady. I stopped, feeling like a fool and almost fearing I had angered her or she might laugh. But she only looked straight at me with her steady gray eyes and said, Thank you, Billy Duncan. I was rather confused, for I didn't know what she was thanking me for, but I rose hastily. She got up, too. I looked down the hot street to where the naked brown children were rolling and at the yellow and brown men who smoked on doorsteps and in a rush it came over me that she was almost alone. She and Douglas Steele, the only white faces in a sea of brown and yellow. A warning against that half-breed fiend, Juan Mardo, leapt to my lips, but I kept back. There had been that in his eyes as he watched her leave the boat that morning that would have made a white man joyfully kill him slowly by inches. Charlie boy, I knew Japs. I hadn't lived in the East five years without knowing that a Jap holds a woman's life and honor at less than nothing. And Juan Mardo had set his eye on my little lady. I wanted to tell her, but then I thought that it could do no good and maybe harm, so I said nothing. But she was quick and had read something in my eyes. What were you going to say? I started and then smiled. Only this, little lady. If you ever want anything or need anything, especially help, you'll know where to get it. She smiled. It wasn't a grin this time, but just a smile that made me feel that she could see my soul, and I wish to God my soul had been cleaner. I'll know where to find it, and I thank you. She put out her hand and I took it, a small, sturdy hand with tapering fingers, and as never before did I want to kiss it. But I was a fool. I knew it then, as well as I do now, and dropping her hand abruptly, I went down the street towards the Caliban. It was two weeks before I saw her again, and then it was only to say hello. She, Douglas Steele, and a gay party of the white planters were sailing in a pretty little white sailboat about an hour out from Laysan. Douglas Steele was at the wheel, all cool in his white suit, and she stood near him in a white midi and skirt. The whole party, there were about seven or eight, hailed us merrily as we passed. All I heard was her voice ringing clearly above them all. Hello, Billy Duncan. The cap leaned over the rail and called. How's the missionary? The whole party roared. She looked grieved, but wrinkling her nose, she yelled back. I'm getting along fine, don't you worry. So they sailed by us, a gay party laughing and chattering. Captain Harrison's kind, Steele's kind, but not Billy Duncan's kind. I think the captain had a hunch of what was in my mind, for I caught the half-pitying glance he gave me as I turned away. I didn't want pity from any man, not even my best friend. The only thing on earth I wanted was her I longed for her as a man perishing of thirst longs for water. My longing amounted to a great hunger for her, for I wanted her so much. The next time I saw her was two weeks later, when the cap and some chinks carried me senseless into Laysan. Of course, I didn't see her while I was in dreamland, but I did afterward. You see... I'd been in a fight aboard the Caliban, and I'd gotten the worst of it. The cap had given me up in disgust, for he had already discovered that I could not keep out of a row, that I had no desire of keeping out of one. Anyway, I had my head laid open by a belaying pin, and that finished my side of the fight. Captain Jim had thrown a bucket of water over me, just as he usually did, 
but this time it had had no effect on me. He began to get anxious when I did not come around in the usual time, so he put into Layson where he knew there was a white doctor. I never found out what happened next, but when I woke up two hours later, the Caliban was out to sea, and I lay in a little hut opposite Senora Castro's with a pale, slim little fellow working over me. My head was aching terribly, so I didn't take notice of anything much at first, except that the little doctor seemed mighty relieved to see my eyes open. But when the doctor turned away and spoke to someone beside him, and that someone's clear voice cried thankfully, Then he's all right, Doc. All the pain and dizziness seemed to leave me. I tried to sit up then, but the little doctor laughed and pushed me back. You can't kill his kind, Miss Ross. Inside of two hours, he'll be as good as ever, and when Captain Harrison comes by tomorrow, he'll be ready to go. Things grew rather hazy then, but I dimly heard the door close and knew the doctor had gone for a time. I almost feared to open my eyes, for I thought I must be dreaming, but when I did at last venture a look, there she was perched on a stool close beside me, a broad grin on her face. I tried to smile, but made a poor job of it. You've been fighting again, Mr. Duncan. I nodded, but said nothing, for there was nothing to be said. Some day you're going to get killed in a scrap. Do you know that you came near dying today? I've come near it many times, I said warily. Had I died today, there would have been no one to care. That's why I live. I stopped before the look in her eyes. I had not been asking for pity or sympathy, even though it may have sounded like it, but she assuredly did not give it. That's a whopper. I know three people at least who would have been sorry if you had died. Who? Captain Harrison for one, Douglas Steele for another, and... And? And myself. Little lady, would you have really cared? I would she answered, looking into my eyes. For I like you, Billy Duncan. And I... The hot words were surging up to my lips, but I forced them back. It would bring her no joy, and perhaps cause her sorrow to know that a rough, hardened soldier of fortune loved her with all the force of his being, and would have gone to hell and back for her. I thank you, I finished. You're welcome. There was an uncomfortable pause, and then I questioned, How goes missionarying? Her face took on an aggrieved expression, but the corners of her mouth twitched. Why, I think I'm getting on fine. I've started a school, you know, for the little kids. But Douglas, he wants me to go home. He says... She stopped short. What does he say? I questioned, my interest arising. Oh, nothing. It wouldn't interest you. I rather think it would. Please, little lady, I said, eyeing her keenly. Well, it's Juan Mardo. She cast a lightning glance at me, but my face was expressionless. Douglas says he doesn't like the way he's acting, but I don't see that he's been doing anything wrong. I don't like him. I couldn't after that affair on the boat. But he's interesting, and he has helped me a lot. Helped you? I questioned, trying to keep an expression from my voice. She looked at me curiously and nodded. At first, I couldn't get any of those little Japs or Chinks to come to me. I tried awfully hard, but it wasn't any use. Their parents wouldn't let them. Then along came Juan Mardo and said he could bring them, and he did. I've more kids than I can manage. Yet Doug kicks something awful. I don't blame him. I said quietly, and I'm going to tell you something I overheard only a short time ago. Three of our crew were leaning against the rail, talking. I understand Jap all right, and they were talking about Juan Mardo and you. Who? Me? Go on, this is getting exciting. They were saying, I went on watching her to see the effect of my words, that Juan Mardo had his eye on you and intended to have you any way he could get you. Her eyes had widened as I had been speaking, and I knew she was intensely interested. 
Ye gods! Then her grin flashed. This is thrilling. Little lady, maybe you don't know what that means. Her eyes narrowed as she threw me a quick glance. Ah, but I do. I'm not that unsophisticated. Then her eyes wandered to the bandage about my head, and her teeth gleamed in a grin again. That was what you fought about? I stared angrily, for I had not intended that she should know. But she was quick, and she saw the truth. There are mighty few men who would fight so for a woman, and I wish I could repay you. I thank you. She put out her hand. You have repaid me, I said, rather roughly, I fear, and I took her hand. You're welcome. She went after that, and I soon fell asleep, my head throbbing like a ship's engine. When I awoke, it must have been midnight or thereabouts, and the moonlight was slanting in through the glassless window. The little shack was stifling, and my head was hot and aching. Getting up, I fished a box of matches from my pocket and lit one, determined to find some water. There was a candle end on the table. So I lit it and reached for the bucket of water that someone, the doctor no doubt, had put on the floor near the bed. I had just tilted it up when I heard a few hasty steps outside, a pause, and then a hesitant knock. I put down the bucket quietly and reached for my knife, but there was no one I knew who would pay me a visit at the unearthly hour. Who's there? I demanded. Me. The door flew open and there stood my little lady. She was clad in a thin white nightdress with a pink silk kimono thrown over it, and as she stood there, she nervously gathered it closer about her throat. Her yellow hair was loose and rumpled, and her little bare feet stuck into pink silk slippers. Her lips were pouted slightly, for she was breathing quickly, and her eyes shone like stars as she came toward me. My God! I gasped and leapt forward. What was she doing here at this time, so dressed? Go back! I cried softly. God, little lady, you can't come in here. It'll be just as bad if I stand in the street. Besides, I've got to see you, Mister Duncan. I've come for the help you promised me. You are in trouble. I questioned, a choking feeling in my throat as I realized it was to me she had turned for aid. Yes, and Douglas. I started at his name, and then, as my eyes ran over the little figure in the clinging pink garment, a deadly chill came into my heart, for I knew that her life hereafter would be hell if anyone had seen her. Little lady, won't it keep till tomorrow? I know what you must think of me, but this is, is life and death. Go on, I said briefly, seeing that something was indeed afoot. Well, Douglas is out gunning for Juan Mardo. What? I cried in astonishment. Yes, he got his pistol this afternoon, and he's been gone ever since. Oh, Billy Duncan, this has been an afternoon of agony. I went to bed, and then about five minutes ago, I heard someone run down the street toward the docks, and it was Juan Mardo. Go on. Right after him came Doug. I was at the window, and I called quietly to him. Didn't you hear me? I shook my head. I was asleep. Go on. Doug didn't stop. I knew you would help me, so I came here. Go on. That's all. But it isn't all, I said quietly, a slow rage beginning to smolder in me against the little half-breed. You haven't told all. But I have. She began twisting her hands nervously. Not all. Why is Steele out to kill Mardo? She seemed to turn pale. Doug, because he's, oh, because he's always hated him. Yes, I said, determined to have the truth. Tell me, little lady. That's the reason. As I looked at her keenly, there rose in my mind some of the tales of the fiendish doings of that half-breed, and a terrible idea took form and sprung into life in my brain. What has Juan Mardo done to you? I shot at her. She looked up into my eyes, and a dull red flush crept up from the neck to hair. Nothing, I swear. I sprang at her and caught her hands. Tell me, I said authoritatively. You are hurting my hands. Tell me. 
I was going into the house this afternoon when he came up. He began to talk queerly. I tried to go in. He, he said... She stopped short and tugged at her braids. Let me go. Tell me. I cannot. I will not tell you. Little lady, was it that? Her eyes rose quickly to mine, read their meaning, and she bowed her head. God, and you? I, I was stunned. He tried to kiss me. Stop, you're hurting my hand. And Doug came from the house. He heard it all. Juan Mardo ran, and Doug got his gun. I tried to stop him, but he went. And you want me to? To stop Doug. Stop him? Help him, you mean? No, no. I won't have Mardo's blood on Doug's hands because of me. You must stop him, for my sake, Mr. Duncan. Perhaps, I said, and then put the question that lay near my heart. Little lady, you intend to marry Douglas Steele sometime? A ghost of her grin crept onto her lips as she answered. Perhaps. Why? Because, I answered slowly, he must come to you with clean hands. You'll stop him then? Yes. Juan Mardo's blood must not be on his hands. And I released her. She walked to the door and then turned, tears in her eyes. God bless Billy Duncan. Wait a minute, I said, stepping over to her. I have something to show you. And I pulled my knife from its sheath at my back and held it out to her. It was a beautiful little dagger of Spanish steel with a silver grip, and her eyes brightened as she took it. She peered at the shaft in the uncertain light and read the words engraved on it. Amigo mio. That's Spanish? Yes. Friend of mine. And it has been my friend. My friends are your friends. Keep it, little lady. For me? Her eyes sparkled. Yes, I said grimly. I'm afraid you'll need it sometime. You'd better go now. I guess I had. Goodbye, Billy Duncan. She held out her hand, the one with the knife in it. It was not meant for shaking, so I bent and kissed the little white hand. As my lips touched it, my eyes were near, amigo mio and I breathed an inward prayer that it would prove her friend if she needed it. She withdrew her hand and for an instant stood in the door, her eyes dark wells of light, and she was gone. One night, a week later, Captain Harris stood uneasily eyeing the falling barometer. I was at the wheel at the time, and I could hear him muttering something about the big storm that was coming our way. The night was stifling, there was not the slightest breeze, and our empty sails sagged mournfully. The sea was glassy, and we were truly as silent as a painted ship up on a painted ocean. How black and still that night was, so different from a moonlight night a week ago when the little lady had come to me for aid. I did my best that night to justify the trust she had placed in me, and though I fulfilled her trust, my self-appointed task was not a success. Ten minutes after my little lady left me, I found Douglas Steele on the waterfront, hunting for the half-breed amongst the bales and boxes on the wharf. I came on him suddenly as I rounded a large box and found his pistol shoved into my stomach. I was not surprised. I had rather expected such a meeting, but I was not prepared for the man I met. Instead of the half-hysterical boy I expected... It was a grim-faced, cool-headed man who confronted me. He did not try to conceal his disappointment that I was not the man for whom he was seeking, but cursed softly. And there on the wharf, with the murky water lapping beneath us, I told him of the little lady's words. He looked at me curiously for a moment, and then questioned quietly. Duncan, if you loved Miss Ross, would you let this fiend run rampant? I don't intend to let him. I am going to kill him myself. Beg pardon, but he is my game. Steele, listen to me, I said, hardly knowing how to express myself. You are the little lady's kind, and someday you'll marry her. He flashed a quick glance at me but said nothing. I went on. Steele, you can't go to her with any man's blood on your hands, no matter what a beast the man may be. 
Besides, she wouldn't ever forget it. Be that as it may, I'm going to kill him. You mean I am, I replied. Well, we argued in the moonlight for half an hour, and I finally got him to agree to my plan, but heaven knows reluctantly enough. He gave me his pistol, and I promised that if I did not succeed that night, I would leave the gun under a big box, for the Caliban was coming in for me at five o'clock. At last we shook hands, and he sprinted up the crooked street, a perfect young animal, with the best of life before him. For the rest of the night, I searched the waterfront and its neighborhood, but I found no Juan Mardo. So when in the early sunrise the Caliban slipped up to the wharf, I shoved the pistol under the box and climbed on board with many a backward look to Senora Castro's little house. I felt in my hip pocket for the heavy automatic I had bought at Yindano, for I was going to Laysen well prepared. Then the cap hurried up. Bill, something fierce is going to break loose soon. Typhoon, I guess, I said, carelessly, for I was thinking of other things. I think not. I never saw anything like this before. We've got to make for port. Laysen is nearest. With a fair wind, we could make it in three hours. Only there isn't any wind. Turn in, Bill, and get some sleep. Give the wheel to Sung Lo. You'll be needed more later on. I turned the wheel over to the chink and went below. How long I slept, I don't know, but when I awoke, the ship was pitching fearfully. A smell of sulfur was in the air, and one of the crew was pounding on my door. When I climbed on deck, a cloud of hot ashes enveloped and almost smothered me. I made my way to where Captain Jim stood at the wheel. He was gripping it with all his strength, trying to keep the Caliban from being swamped in the mountainous seas. As I reached his side, a rain of burning cinders swept over us and the cap staggered back. Take the wheel, Bill, and keep her straight. I'll tend to the men. <sighs> what is it? I gasped, clinging to the wheel of the bucking ship. Volcano, somewhere. He was gone. I let go of the wheel for a moment to tie my handkerchief over my nose, and then I clung for dear life. All over the deck, seabirds were falling, some dead, many flapping and squawking, all adding more noise and confusion to the inferno. Hot ashes and burning cinders rained down, continuously burning through my shirt and blistering my skin. The light over the compass was smashed, but not before I saw the compass needle spinning madly around. Faintly, through its war of the waters and the confusion, I could hear Captain Jim bellowing orders and the terrified screams of the crew. The clouds of gas rolled over us and I began to choke, but I did not release the wheel. The Caliban rose to the crest of waves, how high I could not see, and with sickening lurches shot down into the froth of them. Flood after flood swept our decks, and I remembered that the water was hot. More bursts of cinders, and I was nearly gone when the cap reeled up. Lash the wheel and go below! In a half-dazed way I obeyed, he helping me. Having done our best, we fought our way to the companionway and went below, closing the hatches behind us. There among the smelling, cowering, whimpering crew I fell exhausted and soon went to sleep. When Captain Jim awoke me, it was morning. The sun was blazing down, not a breath of air was blowing, and the quiet sea was covered with an oily gray ash surface. There was no wind to fill our sails, so there we lay, becalmed for hours. I have never known a hotter day than that one. The sun was blistering, and the planks of the deck felt like a hot stove. Even the chinks and japs who were used to the heat suffered that day, and Captain Jim and I fairly dripped perspiration. I know both of us would have been down with the heat had it not been for the ice we had laid in at Yindano. Along about sunset, a brisk breeze came up, and we headed for Laysen. The storm had driven us a good way from our track, but if the breeze held, we would make port at midnight. The breeze did hold, and it was with an easy mind that I slept that night. Tomorrow, I would see my little lady. I was having beautiful dreams when a rough hand woke me, and the cap stood beside me, pale for all his brownness, and I knew something was radically wrong. Bill, what latitude is Laysen? And I noticed pencil and paper in his hand. I told him. I knew what it was, but I thought I was dreaming. What's up? 
Bill, do you know that we're in that spot now? No, I answered, beginning to be puzzled. Is it twelve o'clock? We were to be at Laysan then. Don't you understand? We are there now, but Laysan isn't. It took fully a minute for the hideous meaning of his words to sink in. Somehow, I was stymied, incapable of thought, and I stood staring at him. No, you are joking, I managed to say finally. But I knew before he spoke that he was not. He seemed ten years older, whiter, haggard, and broken. I took a shot at the sun at noon and worked it out. We are directly over Laysan now. God, then Laysan went down in the storm. He looked into my eyes. Then, like a thunderclap, the full significance of his last words burst on me. My mind whirled, incapable of taking it all in. I stared mutely at him and saw the same realization in his eyes. The little lady. It may not be. Sung Lo has steered off his course, I cried, catching at a small hope, as a drowning man at the proverbial straw. I have been steering. Come on deck, Bill. Don't ask me about that night or the next day either. I lived as in a daze, unable to comprehend what had happened. Captain Jim cruised about all the morning, but I could do nothing but think of my little lady. As I had last seen her, framed against the doorway, the light breeze whipping the pink garment about her, her eyes deep and unreadable, and Amigo Mio held to her breast never to see her again, never to hear the ring of her boyish laughter, or to see the rollicking devil in her eyes, never again to feel the sweet womanliness of her presence, never Never. At noon, the cap took another shot at the blazing sun and verified our position. There could be no mistake. Laysan was gone. The sea had swallowed it up and left no traces. We cruised about till the afternoon, hoping against hope that the whole thing was a hideous nightmare, or that in some way we had made a monstrous mistake. But at last we turned for Yindano to bear back the sad news. It was near sunset when a cry from the steersman brought me on deck from my cabin. Boat ahoy! Bill! The cap's yell was full of an indescribable joy. Bill, come up! You damn son of a gun! There's the white boat! I came quicker than I have ever come to any man's call. I did not know what he meant, but only one thing could put that note in his voice. All the crew was lined up on the starboard rail, excitedly jabbering and hopping about. Throwing several out of the way, I reached Captain Jim's side, and my eyes sought what his shaking finger pointed out. The sun was setting in flaming splendor, and the red twirls in the west gave promise of another burning day. Across the water was a bloody path, and in the center of it, coming towards us with all sails set, was a little white boat. As it came, riding gaily over the tops of the waves and gently rising and falling in the swells, a strange silence fell on the gibbering crew. Captain Jim bellowed across the intervening water, Ahoy! The sailboat! We waited, breathless, for the answering hail, but there was none. On came the little boat, her sails bellying in the wind, and I recognized it as the one I had seen the little lady on a month before. Ahoy there! Why don't you answer? The cap yelled angrily and waited expectantly. But with a dreary sinking of my heart, I knew there would never be an answering call from that little white ship. Bill, look. There's... there's something lying on the deck. It's a man. Two men, I'm thinking. No, three. All at once, the crew broke loose again and their ears splitting, gibbering, and the cap whispered to me in a subdued voice, Lower a boat, Bill. I had a boat put over the side, and the cap and I and four Japs rode over to the Merry Maid, for that was the name on the bow. The two of us got on the little deck of the boat and walked to the first body. It was a Jap, somewhat slashed with a knife, but evidently dead from a wound in his chest. The cap and I said nothing, but looked into each other's eyes and moved to the next body. 
We turned him over and found that it was a big Kanaka, a scoundrelly fellow, one of Juan Mardo's satellites. He too had died of a bullet wound, but he was terribly bruised and beaten about the face. I wonder... The third body lay near the cracked and empty water beaker, and before the cap turned it over, I knew who it was. Juan Mardo. One cut on the shoulder. Lord, Bill, I'd hate to die of thirst. He wasn't shot? Nope, only a little bruised. There's been a big fight somewhere. He died of thirst in that inferno yesterday. Wasn't an easy death by his looks. Evidently, was all I said. But as I looked at the contorted face, I almost felt a twinge of pity for him. Dying of thirst in the tropics is a dog's death. We turned him on his face again, and it was not till then that I noticed a broad, half-obliterated trail of blood that lay across the deck and into the little cubbyhole of a cabin. Bill, the cabin. Yes, I replied dully for it seemed as if I were moving in a dream. We both hung back, longing to know the worst, yet dreading what the cabin contained. But finally, I went down the three little steps, in the bloody path, and into the cabin, Captain Jim close behind me. The red sunlight slanted through the portholes and lit up the little cabin with a dreary light, but the quick change from light to semi-darkness half-blinded me. The first thing I saw was a pair of bare feet, covered with dirt and burns and lacerated by contact with sharp rocks. Douglas Steele. And it was. I could see well then. The sun was sinking lower and the light was better. He lay on his back in the center of a dried pool of blood, wearing only a pair of scorched and blackened pajama trousers. All over his bare chest were knife wounds, long slashes reaching from shoulder to waist small deep stabs and short ripped hacks it was douglas Steele that i saw first i took him in at a glance and then buck up bill i heard the cap's quivering voice in my ear then i saw my little lady she sat with her back against the wall holding douglas Steele's head in her lap her eyes were closed she was still but a quiet indescribable smile rested on her lips the smile of a conqueror. She was dressed as I had seen her last, God knows centuries ago, in a white nightgown and the pink silk kimono. As one in a dream, I saw Captain Jim tiptoe across the cabin to her and gently take hold of the pink silk garment. Bill, he whispered softly, and I too crossed the intervening space. Look, Bill. He drew back the kimono, there, the sun's last rays glistening on it, buried to the hilt in her white breast, was Amigo Mio. I remember that even in that dark hour. A thrill of pride came over me when I realized that it had been her friend when she needed it. There had been but little blood. The knife itself stopped the flow. As the sun sank below the horizon, a red beam shot into the cabin full on her face, sending a flush of color into her white cheeks. Her smile seemed to flash as of old, and the sun sank. I never knew what happened next. Something within seemed to snap. After a time, as from afar off, Captain Jim's voice came to me. He carried her through all that hell of lava and hot ashes. He was a man, that boy. They must have boarded this catboat, and in the smoke and Inferno Mardo and his Japs got out too. God in heaven, Bill, but there must have been a fight when the storm died. No doubt the boy threw several overboard. There's his gun. He went and picked up a pistol that lay near the dead man's hand. Empty. He put her in the cabin and fought those fiends outside till their knives got him. He must have crawled bleeding in here to her with his empty pistol and died in her arms. And then the little lady heard Juan Mardo coming. And Bill... She used Amigo Mio. God bless her brave little heart. She wasn't afraid to die. I sat in the gloom. For me, the bottom had fallen out of everything. There was nothing left to live for. Life was dreary, empty. The sun had left my sky and all was dark. Come, Bill, we'd better go now. 
I rose wearily and followed him. At the door I turned and saw Douglas Steele's long body dimly outlined in the twilight. Something rose in my throat and choked me. Thank you, Steele, I said softly, as if he'd been alive. Thank you. Thank you, the captain said. In the ever-deepening twilight, Captain Jim and I stood bareheaded at the rail and watched the Merry Maid slowly sink. We had carried the bodies of Juan Mardo and his men in the cabin, battered down the hatches, and then had stove a hole below the water line. As the twilight thickened, it sank more quickly, and with it sank my heart, my hopes, my life. Somewhere in the South Pacific lies a little white boat with a queer crew, an arch fiend and his two imps, a man who was a man, and a woman who placed her honor far, far higher than her life. The publication of Lost Laysen and the Corollary Letters and Photographs was a joint decision made by the Mitchell Estate, the family of Henry Love Angel, and the Road to Tara Museum in response to overwhelming public interest from around the world. Careful consideration was given to what Margaret Mitchell would have wanted. On behalf of historians, scholars, and Mitchell fans, a thank you goes to them all for preserving this piece of history and the memory of this great author. It may be hard to imagine what Margaret Mitchell's world was like three quarters of a century ago. We can learn names and dates, but realizing what prevailing views were and how they came to be is far harder. Today we can agree on the inappropriateness of certain words and characterizations. However, as much as Mitchell was a woman ahead of her time, she was also very much a part of it. And while Gone with the Wind raised issues from a period in American history that is familiar to most readers, the American public's attitudes toward the Far East in the first few decades of this century may not leap so easily to mind. Margaret Mitchell mixed her knowledge of history and the real world into her fiction, creating characters who spoke with the language of their era. All the text in this novella and her letters appear as Margaret Mitchell set down in her hand over three quarters of a century ago. Margaret Mitchell wrote her novella and many of her letters in pencil, composing entirely in longhand. It's worth noting that the word pledge appears on the front cover of the first composition book and that she shows a subtitle on both covers that reads, The Little Lady Unafraid. On an inside page, Mitchell lists the titles of other stories, now presumably destroyed. Man Who Never Had a Chance, Fortunes of the Four, Silver Spurs, or Comrades Three, and The Lady Doc. Deborah Freer, Mitchell Historian, October 1995. <laughs> Lost Laysen was written by Margaret Mitchell and read by Megan Follows. The introduction and additional text was written by Deborah Freer. The editor was Stephen Strassman, with additional editing and post-production by Common Mode, Paul Fowley, technical director. It was directed by Carol Shapiro and Lawrence Axsmith. The associate producer was Florence Barrow Adams. Lost Laysen was produced by Carol Shapiro. I'm Alison Frazier. This has been a presentation of Simon & Schuster Audio. Lost Laysen is also available in hardcover from Scribner.